Okay. So um, we have three presentations in this section that are going to be a little bit heavy. Is everybody down? Is everybody? Can you handle two more of these heavy presentations? Is that cool? Everybody down. All right. Awesome. Yeah. Good. All right. Thank you. Well, in that case, then um, next, I would like to bring up uh, Miss Kelsey Roman. Miss Kelsey Roman, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so Kelsey's going to be giving us a talk on um, sexual assault prevention. Um, and before we begin, she wanted to give us just a little disclaimer. So um, I'll hand the microphone over to you. Thank you so much, Kelsey. And you can just touch the screen okay. uh, to move on to the next slide. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, um, I wanted to say that uh, this presentation might at points get uncomfortable. Um, it will be talking about sexual assault, not necessarily in graphic detail, but um, if there is anyone that feels the need to leave at any point for the sake of their own comfort, that is completely understandable um, and respected. Okay, um, with that, we can start. All right, so this presentation is particularly on bystander intervention as a method to prevent sexual assault. Um, this is a perspective I haven't really seen talked about a lot. So I just wanted to spread the word. There's my disclaimer. Okay, we're going to open with sexual assault in Hanoi. So I want to say that the majority of sexual assault is not committed by strangers. 72% um, of the time it is committed by someone that the victim knows or is even in a relationship with. However, there are instances in which someone who is, for the most part, a stranger to the victim does attack. Um, and recently, there have been a spate of incidents at venues in Hanoi where women have reported being drugged and assaulted, um, which has brought this presentation uh, to mind. Um, being drugged and assaulted is not a particularly common experience. Uh, the most common date rape drug is alcohol alone, followed by voluntary consumption of substances. Um, so this isn't super common, but it, it has been happening uh, here in Hanoi. And up until recently, there were not many resources to deal with this. Okay. So these are the resources that I have been made aware of. Some of them are currently in development. Um, at the moment, the Hanoi Psychology Group is working in tandem with Family Medical Center. Um, they are hoping to provide victim advocates for immediate psychological and medical needs um, any survivors may face. Um, you would want to contact them more about the initiative because it's currently in the works. They're looking to release a pamphlet in the near future. Um, you are also able to go to your embassy at any point to report a crime, and they are supposed to be supportive in, in this case. Particularly, the UK embassy is currently working with local police to develop all-female police units. Um, they're hoping these police units will offer a more supportive response than the Hanoi police have been able to in the past. Uh, finally, there's Peace House Shelter, um, which is uh, for um, a shelter for people who've experienced gendered violence, particularly women. Um, they offer direct counseling and a 24-7 hotline. Um, there are Vietnamese and English services. The program was primarily designed for Vietnamese women, but they did confirm with me that they are open to helping anyone who has experienced gendered violence. Okay, so while it's great that these resources exist um, or are coming into existence, many people will never receive help from these sorts of resources because 77% of sexual assaults go unreported um, due to issues like fear of dismissal, fear of retaliation, and fear of reliving trauma, among others. Um, furthermore, 
if you are living in Vietnam, whether you are native or a foreigner and you're unfamiliar with the legal system or the reporting process, it can be a really isolating experience to go to through. Um, right here I have a quote from the UK Embassy which says, um, there is a high burden of proof on the victim to demonstrate sexual relations were not consensual, especially when the victim had consumed alcohol. And you will usually be required to sign documents in Vietnamese. You should take care to only sign documents that you're confident have been translated accurately. That is a serious burden to place on someone who's just experienced something traumatic. So with that in mind, I've come to the conclusion, and I think you can probably agree, that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It would be way better if no one got sexually assaulted. Now, obviously, it's not completely preventable, but the question is, what can we do to prevent it, and to what extent? So here are my ideas on what prevention should not look like. Now, this is my own moral stance here, um, but I do have my reasons. Um, I do believe that when we advise women to adjust individual behaviors as a sole method of prevention, we enforce an idea of an ideal victim. And this is a problem because it's almost like the virgin whore dichotomy where there is a good person who has done all the things that they can do to protect themselves and anyone who falls outside of that accepts some of the blame for what's happened to them, that's extremely isolating and psychologically damaging and not supportive at all. Um, furthermore, when we assume an individual is responsible for the moments leading up to a non-consensual attack, that's just world bias, which is fallacious. Um, the world is not a just place. People, the things that happen to people are not necessarily deserved. Um, or fair, and when we try to justify them, we, we isolate ourselves from others and we single out victims so that they are not supported. Another response I see is holding rapists accountable for not raping. You know, you have a lot of discussions that are like, oh, don't tell me not to get raped, teach men not to rape. And while that sounds good in theory, and I think consent discussions are very important and uh, worth having uh, in a lot of contexts, um, there are many perpetrators out there who are serial offenders. Now, psychological studies that have looked at uh, rapists have found that they will admit that they have committed what would be legally defined as a rape and then refuse to acknowledge it as a rape. Okay, so there have been a few different studies on who constitutes the serial perpetrators. One in 2002 um, that took place on a U.S. <coughs> um, campus, and that's in Boston, it's a computer tech school, found that less than 8% of men were responsible for 90% of sexual assaults. Um, this is extremely alarming to think that there are just a few people out there, a handful of people who are truly dangerous. Um, later studies have contradicted that somewhat, somewhat and found it spread over uh, a wider variety of people. Um, a study in 2015 that was longitudinal, done over many years, found that 25% of perpetrators could be considered serial offenders. But Whatever the numbers are, these serial perpetrators exist, and if you tell them not to rape, it's not really going to get through to them, because this is what they do, and they still don't see themselves as rapists. So at this point, I believe it falls on us to take responsibility for our community. Um, the problem is, that's not always an easy thing to do. People are least likely to intervene in witnessing a sexual assault compared to if they witness a theft or a physical assault. Um, something called the bystander effect happens especially in large groups of people where everyone just sort of waits around thinking, well, someone else will handle it, right? And they don't know exactly how to best approach the situation, even though internally they know something wrong is happening. Um, in response to this, Dr. Dorothy Edwards of the University of Kentucky developed the Green Dot Program. Uh, and the schools in Kentucky, particularly high schools over a five-year period, that implemented this Green Dot program saw a 50% decrease in reported sexual violence, which is huge, uh, which is 
in comparison to the schools that did not implement the program. I'm so, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, you're doing a great job. This is totally on us. I'm sorry, everybody. If we can have, I think, eight seconds, we'll be able to get through that. Okay, should I just going to deal with this? Yep. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. All right. While we're waiting, the uh, the twenty five percent is that twenty five percent of the eight percent? No, no. So these are two different studies. One particular study said eight percent of rapists were responsible for ninety percent of rape. And another study that was conducted years later uh, found that twenty five percent of people who admitted to non consensual consensual sex acts were serial perpetrators. Oh, that's the twenty five percent who admitted. Yes. Okay. So. Is, is this talking about specifically people who have raped someone, or is this more broadly sexual assault? So it is broadly sexual assault in, in these cases. Um, and one of the problems with the 8% study um, is that the way that they calculated the sexual assault um, is like for each non-consensual act, they would mark them as like a serial rapist. So those numbers are, you know, like if there were multiple acts that were non-consensual, it would become an issue, and they would obviously be responsible for more acts in comparison to others. Um, okay. Yes, as I was saying, in order to combat uh, bystander effect, Dr. Dorothy Edwards and the University of Kentucky developed the Green Dot Program. There was a 50% decrease in sexual violence reported at schools that implemented it over a five-year period, compared to an increase um, a slight increase, that is, to schools that did not implement the program. So what exactly about this program was so successful? It's fairly simple. Um, there are three Ds to the Green Dot program. The first one is direct, and this involves directly confronting a potential assault if you feel you're not endangered. Uh, the second is distract. You create a distraction to prevent the situation from escalating. And the third is delegate. If you do not feel safe to do so, you can find an authority figure or someone else that may assist you. So let's briefly think of an example. Let's say you're out on a night with friends and you're aware of your surroundings. You notice that someone that is a stranger to you who came with a group of friends has gotten very wasted over the span of a few hours and has somehow become separated from their friends. You notice another stranger who you had not seen before who is touching them in a way seems sexual, the person who is wasted seems oblivious. What can you do? One, you can be direct if you feel safe to do so. You can go up and say, hey, I don't think this person is really looking for that type of attention right now. But a lot of people would feel intimidated to do this, so there are other options. You can distract. Uh, some things you can do is you can start a conversation with the perpetrator and try to distract them from what they're doing. You can start a conversation with the victim. You know, one of the methods I've heard is pretending you know someone from way back. Hey, it's so crazy to see you here. Come, we need to catch up. Um, you can spill a drink if you're feeling like doing that. That's another option. Um, there are a few things that you can do, but the ultimate goal is to get the potential victim away from the potential perpetrator. Um, if you don't feel safe to do any of these things, delegating could be talking to a bouncer, talking to the bar staff, finding the group of friends you saw the person with earlier and saying, hey, I see your friend over there. Are they doing all right? Do they know that person? Is everything okay? Um, these are some ways to act in a situation that prevent bystander effect. Uh, Why is it called green dot? You know, I can't quite figure that out. She defined it as each good thing that you do is a green dot, a positive effect in your community, but I don't know what the green dot in itself symbolizes. It's just, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, so the question comes um, to me, what would communal responsibility for prevention in Hanoi look like? So here's some proactive responses um, proactive being before anything bad happens. Um, make plans with all of your friends of how they're getting home before they go out. Keep to those plans as best as you can. Um, make sure you are aware of the people that you are with um, as the night progresses and take that little extra bit of responsibility. Um, 
be aware of your surroundings. So look around, notice how people are socializing around you, um, and keep your eye out for anything that you might see as unbecoming, uncomfortable, or inappropriate. And trust your gut. If you see something that you think is wrong, it is better to try and clarify and be a bit embarrassed than do nothing and end up regretting it later. Um, reactive responses. Um, these are some things that uh, people have done and can do um, in the wake of recent events. Uh, one is you can support local initiatives like Hanoi Get Home Safe. Um, Joe Rushton uh, runs this group and <coughs> it's a by woman, for women, um, almost like motorbike taxi service where if you don't feel comfortable or safe taking a grab at a certain hour, you can post in the group and someone will offer to help you, possibly. Um, the issue is getting enough people to support the group that it gets off the ground. Um, so you can look into that if that's something that you're interested in using or participating in. Um, you can also hold local venues accountable for security. Um, this particularly is Birdcage's response after a recent assault that occurred on their property. Um, they did confirm with me uh, privately in message that they have installed security cameras to cover all blind spots, um, that their bar staff is trained to look for warning signs, that they've hired a bouncer from England who is particularly familiar with how to protect people, and that they're willing to photograph the license plates of taxi drivers and um, guests if needed uh, to make sure that it is a safer environment from here on out. Um, one of the reasons I have this, them up here is not only because I think that's a really positive response to take that level of responsibility, um, but also because I want to hold them accountable. I want people to know that they made these promises, and I want people to expect them to live up to these promises. So now you all know. Um, the last thing you can do, and this is a bit controversial, is call out language promoting sexual violence amongst friends and jokes. Now, I have always considered humor as a way of coping with the dark realities of life, and I like an off-color joke myself uh, now and again. Um, but something that really interested me while I was doing my research was that one of the main factors that was held in common amongst sexual assault perpetrators were friend groups that tolerated uh, conversations that were violent towards women. So, you know, maybe not forever, it's not a joke for everyone when someone says something like that. Maybe some people actually feel that way. And I think certain comments should be called into question just to confirm, you know, how serious are you? Do you know that this type of humor can actually promote these ideas in particular people's heads. Um, so those are my tips and tricks for keeping Hanoi a little bit safer. And I want to end on a note of um, group discussion. I'd like you guys to get into your groups and spend a couple minutes just to talk about what you can do personally to make Hanoi safer as a community in regards to sexual assault prevention.